we'll get started. I'm glad that uh, some of you I know are joining us for the first time, and that's great. Um, and then uh, what we're going to do, we've looked at before was the Apostles' Creed, uh, the uh, beginning of, but didn't talk through the Ten Commandments, did the Lord's Prayer. Uh, last week we looked at Holy Baptism, and then tonight we're going to look at the Sacrament of the Altar, or the Sacrament of Holy Communion. And I'm going to move my camera to this side, because I keep looking at the piece. Because that's where I can see. There. So, um... The sacrament of the altar, or Holy Communion, is what um, the other sacrament of our church is. Um, as we said, there are two sacraments in the church for the Lutherans. And uh, again, with what it is for us, is that the... I have to change my screen again here. There we go. Um, when we talk about what makes a sacrament, we talked last week about baptism being a sacrament because it is a gift of grace. And that is the primary first purpose is that it is a gift that brings you God's grace, that it is commanded in scripture, and so, or participated, that Jesus participated in, in um, participate in that uh, action himself, and then also uses earthly elements. And so when we look at Last week, it was Holy Communion. It uses uh, water. Jesus was baptized by John. So it certainly means that this is one of our sacraments because it meets that criteria um, and it offers grace. And so now when we look at Holy Communion, it offers grace. Jesus instituted this practice um, at the Last Supper. Um, he took what was a very common um, traditional meal and turn that into being a sacrament as he participated with his disciples. And it uses earthly elements because the earthly elements would be in this case wheat that makes bread and then the grapes that become wine. And so that is um, the, 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 the three pieces that it needs to have to make sure that it is a sacrament in the church. And especially in this one, um, Jesus says in scripture, do this in remembrance of me. So it becomes a command. Um, and it's something that we are to do to remember him and the gift that it is giving to us and that gift of grace. So that is, is uh, how it meets our ideas of what a sacrament is. Then we even ask the question, this is how Luther put it in the small catechism, is what is the sacrament of the altar? And it is recorded where it is written that it is in uh, the holy evangelist of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that St. Paul also wrote, and you'll recognize these words, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So you hear that it is a piece of scripture that you hear. These are what we would call the words of institution. So if you ever look in a bulletin somewhere and they write out um, each little step of the, the worship and liturgy, um, if they write the words of institution, that is that section of scripture that is said um, when the, uh, the elements are, <clears throat> are being blessed for communion. And it says, um, Luther said, it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and drink. But I like what he also wrote in the large catechism. There's a small catechism, that one's the one, just to remind you, that is used in the household for parents to teach their children. The large catechism was used by pastors and teachers because it gives a little bit more detail, goes in a little bit further on a given topic. But in the large catechism, Luther wrote this. 
It is the true body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in and under the bread and wine, which we Christians are commanded by Christ's word to eat and drink. As we said of baptism, that is not mere water. So we say here that the sacrament is bread and wine, but not mere bread or wine such as is served at a table. It is the bread and wine comprehended in God's word and connected with it. I think last time I kind of mentioned about the three little words that we use in, with, and under. Um, and in communion, this one is specific to communion, is that, um, I gotta remember if we do the next page, nope. Um, we look at, at in this sacrament as we are sharing communion with one another, that the presence of Christ is in this meal it's with all of the people who are gathered together to celebrate it. And when it says under it, it's, it's something sacred that is supported by God's word. So when we talk about in, with, and under, um, it is that that sacrament is being lifted up in the church as something that is sacred. Then, uh, just, and I started to mention it last, last week, was we follow the practice in the Lutheran church that ordained pastors are being the only ones that would preside or celebrate, oversee um, communion in a church. And so this has really been a, a topic lately in the last several months of our church, because when we talk about the pastor being the one that is there to consecrate the elements, and when we're not able to join together in the sanctuary, then we figure out how can we do this? because usually it's the pastor that is there and present. So um, even in congregations, there's many of them in Nebraska that maybe are served by one pastor and there's two or three congregations that that pastor serves. When I was in Creston and Lee, I served two congregations at the same time. Um, and so if, if I wasn't going to be at one of the churches, they didn't have communion that day because I was the one that to be able to consecrate the elements. It's part of what the church has decreed as proper. It's also a phrase where it talks about keeping the order, keeping the good order, that if you're trained to do this and you do it properly, then there's control over it. And that then it is only done in a special way, the same way all the time. So as I said, these last several months have been very interesting for the life of the church because as you saw when we do our online uh, worship services on the weekend. We, at first, for the first probably month and a half or so, we didn't do communion as a part of the worship service. Because when I was trained, um, that pastor had to be there and be present. And if that, if the pastor wasn't, then you didn't do communion. So we really hemmed and hawed about it for a while. And I was talking to Daryl and, and trying to decide what we were going to do. And so we finally looked at it that when I heard somebody tell me, well, we, we just did our own communion. And they went, oh. And I, my only question was, please tell me you didn't use Oreos and milk. That's all. I didn't want to know that you didn't use at least some bread or cracker and some wine or grape juice. So then I told Daryl, okay, it's time that we need to put this into the service. And so that's why we did it and put it in um, our service now so that we say those words, you can hear the words, and it's as close as we can do uh, without being present with each other. And then I had two different um, colleagues of mine from different congregations, one's in Fremont and another one that's here in Omaha, call me and he said, I see that you added it to your service, which kind of made me feel like he was stalking us. But... Um, I said, yes, we did. And he goes, okay, explain how you came to that idea. And as soon as I told him that we are to be charged with keeping the good order and making sure it was done in a proper way, he said, okay, now I get it. And so for us, it has made it easier uh, to understand that we're still participating in the meal together, even though it might be totally different times when everybody's watching the service. Um, but it's an opportunity for us to still, still um, celebrate communion. 
it has been uh, difficult, I will say, not having communion in the sanctuary uh, since March. And uh, I'm hoping that that will change. Um, so we have to, and even when we come back, it will be different the way that we do communion. And I can, I'll share that at the end. So when we look at um, celebrating this sacrament and keeping the good order, we also have to make sure of these three different things, because this is the question that Luther kind of wanted to answer. What is the benefit of such eating and drinking? And I'm going to read what he wrote. It says, the words given for you and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin show us that forgiveness of sin, life and salvation are given to us in the sacrament through these words, because where there is forgiveness of sin, there is also life and salvation. So it's also not in just the eating and the drinking of the elements, but it is what this brings to us. It brings us life and salvation and that gift of grace. So that is where we focus on how the sacrament, um, what the benefit of it is. But then it says, how can bodily eating and drinking do such a great thing? And he wrote this, eating and drinking certainly do not do it, but rather the words that are recorded, given for you and shed for you in forgiveness of sin. These words, when accompanied with the physical eating, are the essential thing in the sacrament. So I said before, last week with the sacrament of baptism, that water in the font right now is water. It just comes out of the faucet that comes up through the bottom of the floor and fills the font. It's just water. But it's when the water and those words are used that it becomes something sacred. And so it's the same thing when we celebrate Holy Communion. It's when the elements are there, we are gathered, and those words are used at the same time, it becomes this holy sacrament. Then it says, who then receives the sacrament worthily? That was one that Luther loved to write about. He said, fasting and bodily preparation are in fact a fine external discipline, but a person who has faith in these words given for you and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin is really worthy and well prepared. However, a person who does not believe these words or doubts them is unworthy and unprepared because the words for you require truly believing hearts. So he goes back, he's saying that we are worthy to receive this because we believe what it gives us, this gift of grace. Now, do you know of a church maybe that says you have to come and tell us the day before uh, that you are going to take communion, that you've prepared yourself for that? Yes. Anybody grow up Missouri Synod? Ooh. So did you practice having to, sometimes it changes, but did it, did you have to go and announce yourself to the pastor beforehand yes. that you were going to take communion? Yes, on Wednesday nights. Oh, Wednesday. Yep. Then you had to be really good between Wednesday and Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody else have to do that too? It was difficult for visitors to take communion. They had to like visit with the pastor. And, and visit with them like prior to worship? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We just signed up the week before. That was Sunday before. Oh, like huh? making reservations? Yeah. <laughs> mm hmm so in here, Luther's saying that, you know what, the fasting and all those things, it's good. You, you know, you're thinking about it, you're preparing yourself, but it's not ultimately necessary. Because if you believe what this gift is that is being given to you, that's what makes the difference. Because if we're trying to look as I am worthy of doing this, just because um, we do the confession. So it's, it's, we hear the words of the confession and forgiveness, that cleanses us at the beginning of our worship service. So it opens us up to being able to enjoy the sacrament. So for us, we don't look at that as a way in which we have to require that ahead. Um, but rather, it's something that, that we are supposed to enjoy together. 
Ask so I had a question for you um, because communion is celebrated in so many different ways. I know for us growing up, um, communion was not celebrated very often when we were really little. It was only a few times a year, um, especially on celebrations like Easter or Christmas and things like that and a few other times during the year. Then it kind of changed to about once a month and then it changed, I think, to every other week. And then I don't remember when it changed to every week. But do you remember that of any of your traditions that you grew up in of not celebrating communion very often? Mm -hmm. Every other when, week was pretty common. Okay, every other. Mm -hmm. Once a month in our case. Once a month. <laughs> once a month, once a month yeah. end of the That's month. where the kneeling rail was. Oh, yeah. Oh, you knelt so, for that's communion. Right. Yeah, we always knelt for communion, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want yeah, to ours... on that tile right now? <laughs> no. <laughs> it hurts. I used to tell that to Ken when we had to do that on Good Friday. We knelt on the, kneeled down on those steps. But every time we stood up, I got up faster than he did, and his knees cracked, so that was okay. But... <laughs> Yeah, communion, we, we celebrated it very rarely. And now for us, especially, we celebrate it every week at every service. Um, it's part of our worship. And so, so that has changed over the years. Why, what has caused that change? Or what, what caused that change? My, Good question. Usually why, in fact, it started out that communion wasn't celebrated as frequently is because of that thing about the pastor had to be there. Okay. And there were fewer clergy than the churches. And so if the pastors showed up, then you'd have communion. And so it's really just been that with more clergy being able to serve the church, then it's made it so that we can do that more frequently. And also there's been a change for us to make sure that we incorporate um, the sacraments into our um, daily or weekly worship, is that it's something that has been... Um, much more of a focus put on the sacraments in the last probably 34 years than it had been previously. But a lot of that first reason for pastor or for people not communing very often was just because nobody was available. Um, and unless like now there, there might be congregations in Nebraska that are served by a uh, PMA or a deacon, unless the bishop gives them and grants them permission if they are given permission, they can celebrate the sacrament with that congregation. So it, it has helped also um, those places being able to celebrate it more often. Um, how many of you had com um, communion after you were confirmed, but not before? Okay. I always say they use that as the carrot at the end of the stick, is that <laughs> if you come to confirmation, then you get to have a styrofoam round piece that sticks to the roof of your mouth um, the day of your confirmation, right? So it was one of those that they held that out there that you were not able to have it until um, you had gone through instruction of confirmation. And that has changed over the years in many different places. Um, for us, we have at fourth grade, the kids go through a Holy Communion class, and they and do that with their parents. And then on Monday, Thursday, uh, we celebrate Holy Communion with them uh, in the sanctuary. And that's a great day for them uh, to be able to participate again with the, with the congregation. It's, you, it, it's, it's really a great day because you see the kids coming up and they're so excited to have um, their first communion. And you, you always know it's them because they come up and Sue has been very good about telling you to stick your hand out like this and you do like this and you put it up. So these are kids are coming up almost halfway up the aisle already with their hands out because they don't want to forget. Um, but it's, it's such a neat experience that they get to then feel like there's another way in which they are a part of the congregation, a part of the church. Um, I served up at Lord of Love for four years and they had... Um, the understanding that you could have communion at any age um, if the child maybe understood or just wanted to participate. And so you could be a two-year-old and have communion. 
And I, I think I shared this with you, but there was one week that um, this little wonderful little girl would come up every time for communion and she was so excited to receive it. And she would stand up there and put her hands up and then take communion. And on her way back, she told her mom, I had a little something to eat and a little something to drink. And so it was just this way that she felt though that she was participating in this meal together. I mean, it was something that she got to do um, with the people that she worshiped with. So um, whether or not we ever have a full understanding of what the sacrament is, I think we understand it at different levels in our life. Um, there was also, I think it was um, Bishop Anderson um, was asked one time about why we celebrate communion so often. That it, if we celebrate it all the time, it won't be as special as when we only do it once a month or a few times during the year. And he had this wonderful response. He said, how often do you kiss your spouse? Do you do that once a year, a couple of times a month, you know, periodically? Now, if you kissed her every day, does that lessen the amount of love that you have for your spouse? And they said, well, no. And so it was that same sense of just because we're doing it frequently, it doesn't lessen the importance or the, the specialness that it has. Um, instead, it becomes incorporated into what we do um, as a worshiping community. So I always remember, I thought that was always a good response, um, that it is something that we do frequently and why we do it is to, to um, share that grace that comes to us so often. There's um, two words that um, some of you might, if you grew up Catholic, um, consubstantiation and transubstantiation. Cons con is with, trans is if it's changing over, transforming or changing into something else. So for us as Lutherans, remember that in with and under. So with, we are ones who understand as we share this meal together that the substance of the bread and the wine does not change physically, but rather the spirit and presence of God and Christ are in and with and under the meal. So that's consubstantiation. Transubstantiation is when, quite the way that they wrote it quite simply, um, is that the actual bread and wine change into the physical body and blood of Christ. We say that there is no scriptural reference that that would happen. And so that is why if, you, um, uh, if you're in the Catholic Church, they, they believe that during that Mass, um, those elements change into the body and blood of Christ. I was up at a church in Norfolk. I was participating in a uh, Lutheran Catholic wedding. And when it came time for communion, I had to leave the chancel area because I'm Lutheran. So they put me down uh, behind a screen. Yeah, it was very welcoming. Um, so I went down, I sat behind this screen and they then celebrated communion. And at one part, when the priest lifted up the host, I heard this ring, 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 ring. And that is that at that moment is when it was supposed to change and be the body of Christ. In my sarcasm, I thought the phone was ringing and wanted to say, do you want me to get that? But it was, I had never heard, there's like four little bells and ring, 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 ring. Yeah. And they do that at the time of the bread and at the time of the wine. And so it's, it's that time that they say the words that they feel as though this changes into the body and blood of Christ. So it's, it's a way in which we say, though, that they just coexist, um, that the presence of God is in the midst of that meal and in yeah. us physically. So it, it's a different change for us. What I thought we should do also is look at the ways in which, I move my cursor here. Um, you probably recognize this. 
Um, it's still there, don't worry. Um, our chancel area, and the chancel is that part uh, that is separated out for the clergy, the sacraments to be celebrated, and sometimes they will say it's a place where the choir is. But the, the chancel is that part where the altar, that whole area where the altar sits. So that tile piece on the top, um, and it's elevated above the sanctuary floor, usually by steps or um, it'll say sometimes it's separated even by a screen uh, that, that would be there. But the chancel is that area where it's the, the place for the clergy and for the sacraments to be held. So that is one of the reasons that ours is lifted up and only the things that happen there are the reading and preaching of scripture and the sacraments. This is separate from the nave. The nave is the place where the people sit. Um, and so that's out where the pews are. So there's the nave and the chancel. So that's the area in our church where the chancel is. Then, <clears throat> come on. This next one shows you, um, uh, yes, Kim. <laughs> okay. Altars have changed over the years too, okay? In this picture, this is actually the church where my sister and I grew up. This is in St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Santa Monica, California. And the um, inside of the sanctuary has a really long extended nave area. And then the chancel is way up towards the front of the church. And if you look, and this is the closest picture that I could get of it, um, if you look at the altar up there, it's brown, and I don't know if my, can you see my cursor at all? Uh -huh. Okay, good. Yep. This is the altar, and the altar at that time is very long and narrow, and it's up against the wall, and so when you would stand at the altar, the pastor most often did communion with his or her back to you. And so all you got to see was this, you know, not lifting up, things like that, but you never could really see maybe what was going on. Altars like this, the long and narrow ones, were very early on in the temple and in early churches because also um, they were used as sacrificial altars. So on there, with it being long and narrow, now this is, this was, Pastor Kim's favorite thing. He said, junior high kids ate this stuff up, is that they would take the animal and they would fling it up onto the altar and then they would gut it. The blood's coming out and they would scoop the blood and fling it on the people as a way where <laughs> they were blessing them. Yes. Pretty gross. So that was the tradition of the altars. It's very much about a sacrifice and that the understanding of Christ sacrificing himself for us. So for years, that is where, uh, when we grew up, that is where the altar always was. You'll see now, down here in the middle, they've moved a different altar that they put down there to celebrate. It's also closer to the people because this was quite a distance. This is where the choir would sit. This is the massive organ. It's a beautiful organ. And then um, this whole area was the chancel for them. Right here, that's the baptismal font. It's little, not like ours. It's just little. But my sister and I were both baptized in that thing. Um, so um, that would be the way in which the altar was used if it's for sacrifices. Then if you look at our altar, though, it is not long and narrow. It is a table. And it's very intentional that ours is a table when they designed our sanctuary because a table with the four sides, all four sides are equal. So when we come up, it's a meal that we celebrate at the Lord's table. So we gather around it. And however you approach the altar, you are the same. You are equal. So each of the four sides are exactly the same. 
And I can kind of took the side picture of it too, so you can see the sides of it. But that is why um, our altar is designed that way. And that many of the churches now that, that are a little bit newer um, are starting to make the altar in that design um, rather than having something that's shoved up against the wall. Because it's also a way in which um, you can stand and see the people because now the elements are sitting in front of the pastor and then the people can see um, what is actually going on. And so it's a way in which it's much more like you're involved in participating um, rather than just watching somebody's back. Um, sometimes the pastor, I used to do this sometimes was when the altars that we had up in Creston and Lee were very much like the sacrificial altar up against the wall. Um, sometimes the pastor will turn around and say the things and then, but then you've got a lot of turning around to do and moving around. So it's a little easier to do it that way. Pastor Brad? Yes. I have a question. In a number of the churches, such as you in your home church, the carpets are always red by the altar area. Is there a particular significance of that? Um, I think it's the sense of just like um, the royalty, even though purple is usually the sense for royalty, but a lot of churches had um, that red carpet. It was something bright and welcoming or royal is the only thing I've ever heard. I don't know. There's not a, they might've had a sale on red carpet or something. I don't know, but um, <laughs> yeah, it depends. Cause then nowadays I've gone in several of them that, that it's not red anymore. Um, some of them are, you know, just uh, gray. Um, so yeah, there wasn't as that I know of a specific reason. Yeah, and that looks the same as uh, the church I grew up from. Yeah, even the uh, the pastor's uh, chairs were covered with a red material on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in fact, I think the cushions at St. Paul's were red, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I love the front of our sanctuary. Now, one thing, if you might notice, you see where the chairs are? Does anything look different right along the wall? Over here? Yeah, there's no table there. There's the no table. table there. The tables have moved. The tables moved. Yes. Because now the pastors are six feet apart. Ah. <laughs> it's for distancing. Yeah, Daryl and I had an argument. I don't want to sit in the room anymore. So, <laughs> in fact, I almost like it this way. It's kind of it, it's easier to walk into the sanctuary or the sacristy door back there. You're not trying to dodge the table. But for when we come back, we're going to leave them that way for a while just because it's spacing us out if we're sitting up in the front. So we did move those. The only thing we've moved, everything else is just taped off. I also thought that um, you would be able to see um, some of the communion wear. This is the one we use most often is the green. Uh, we have a blue and we have brown. I think it's brownish black. Yeah. And so these all have specific names. The, the, this is the flagon, the chalice, and both of these have the same name, a patent. Basically, it's a pitcher, cup, and a plate. Much easier to remember. So this is where, when we put wine in here in the, in the sacristy, then um, it is usually covered with a cloth, and then the chalice also has a cloth and then the little patent that goes on top and then um, the actual bread you know, goes onto the larger patent. Does anybody know why this little patent plate goes over the top of this chalice? Well, in the early, early church, they didn't have a lot of good roofs. <laughs> Things were kind of open, right? So things like dust, dirt, bugs, those kind of things would get into the chalice. And so that little patent is put on there. And sometimes I didn't put the cloth over there. Usually the cloth is first and the patent goes on there. And it was basically to keep the bugs out. Nothing sacred 
just it keeps the keeps it clean. I will say it doesn't always work. And especially in the flag. And I see you smiling, Courtney. Many years ago when I was first here at Rejoice, I poured out the wine into the chalice and thought I saw something. And it was a fly, a big fly, like a horse, horse fly. <laughs> Allison Bentley was standing behind me. I reached in and I flung it back onto the floor and just about hit her with it. But it was this gross drowned fly that was in there. And then I thought, hmm, <laughs> now I have to drink this. So it, I'm still here. But that's really the, the reason that this little plate was even put on there was to keep it as something that would keep the element clean. Um, and that's even why we use some of the corporals that go over the bread. And the purificator is the narrow cloth that you'll see us use and to wipe the rim of the cup. Um, it's called a purificator. And you go around and you wipe that off. Then, some of you know where this is. This is the sacristy. And the sacristy is where all of the communion elements and other churchy things are kept for, for worship. The banners are back here. Um, there's also different cloths that we use for Good Friday. The funeral pall is kept back here that we put over a casket. Um, there's also the sink where many of you and many of you um, are ones that help with communion and cleaning up. Um, but this is the place where all that happens. So the communion cups are filled, all the bread is prepared um, for the, the plates. Uh, all that happens back in here. Then we have, this is called a piscina sink. Now there's two sinks back there. The one that you can see here is just a regular sink with two sides, hot water, cold water. This though is a piscina and it says special drain direct to the ground for the disposal of consecrated wine only. This is used, we need to get a U, use very little water, it will overflow. <laughs> this sink goes down to a sand pit area that's below the sanctuary. And that is because when you have consecrated elements for worship, uh, if it's, especially the, the bread and the wine, is that if you do not use it, it either one needs to be consumed, and so you can stand back there and eat the rest of the bread and drink the rest of the wine, or it has to be returned to the earth. So you can take the wine and pour it out in the grass, um, but in here it's a little easier, especially in the winter time, that you don't have to open the door and kind of get rid of it in the, in the ground. Um, it drains down into that sink. And then we take the bread, and a lot of times people will just eat it, take it home and eat it, it's fine. Or uh, you can throw it onto the ground and let the animals eat it, it's fine. But you're just not throwing Jesus in the trash can. That's the, the reason um, that you're still respecting these elements that we have used for this <coughs> sacrament and holding them um, as something special. Um, so in fact, um, at our home church, we had an interim pastor one year, um, and he followed this to the T. So much so that even the water that the glasses were washed in had to go out and be dumped in the ground. Couldn't go down the sewer drain. And so uh, it was Pastor Crowner. I just remembered his name. Um, so they had to wash the cups in plastic tubs instead of in the sink. And then they had to go out and dump the water onto some plants that were outside. Well, after a while, we noticed that the, the one that was closest to the door was growing three times faster than <laughs> any of the other bushes that were out there. We don't know if it was the wine or it just got a lot of, lot of water. Um, but he, he took that to the nth degree, is to make sure that that is the way that you treated the sacraments for communion. So he, he was very, very much about making sure it was followed down to the letter. Um, so we, we do our best and um, 
the, the sacristy is a place I think that the kids, once they get back there, because we show them when we would show them that for communion or when we were doing the acolytes, that mm -hmm. they'd go back there and they were always intrigued to see um, what was actually back there because they always wondered where the pastors went when they go to wash their hands um, and what was really back there. Um, so this is, this is a, a unique sacristy. Not a lot of churches are able to have as much as we do in this, in this space. So it's kind of a neat place to have. What are some questions you have about communion? Anything you can think of? Pastor. Pastor. Yes, Pearl. I wanted to say that out in Oregon, our sacristy was off to the side, and the children knew that the bread and the wine uh, was going to be thrown out, and they could, they would come back and drink all the white grape juice that was in. <laughs> so, and they would take us, if there was a lot of bread, I could get rid of all the bread. The kids would take it take and it. go and eat the bread and wine yeah. or grape juice. <laughs> well, in the Catholic church, the priest stands in front of everybody and just finishes it off. I think we need to read <laughs> that in the Lutheran church, but... Roger, you were going to ask something? Are, are the words of institution consistent among Christian churches, or are they, do they vary? They, they're pretty consistent. Okay. Yeah. There, there might be just a few word changes or something, but for the yeah. most part, they're pretty consistent. Right. Yeah. Okay. I just think for us, we certainly um, celebrate communion more frequently than some of our other Protestant friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. How many of you ever had um, communion in a Catholic church before you were Catholic? Or if you were Catholic, that doesn't count when you were Lutheran. <laughs> we were always told we couldn't do it. Yeah, that's right. They won't let you do it. We I know. never tried because we were always told you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't do it. Thank you for saying you shouldn't. Yeah. So our neighbors, I went with Frankie when, when, uh, time up to, I can't remember the name of that Catholic church they went to. And I went up for communion and I took it. Wow. But there I married so a, many people in there they didn't know. I married a Roman Catholic and I chose not to convert. And my brother-in-law was a Jesuit. And when we married, he said a husband and wife should come to the communion table together. So I do take communion. When my husband's there, I don't when yeah. he's not there. If he's not there. In the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. We have an open table for communion. So we say anyone is welcome to come. And they'll kind of hear us um, welcome people to come up for, you know, all are welcome to the Lord's table. Um, we have done that in a very intentional way. And over the years is to make sure that people understand that no matter what tradition they come from, they are welcome. Yvonne, I saw your hand. Uh, years ago, when uh, Marie was in the Augustana Choir, they were invited to sing at a service at the Vatican. And when we saw the choir went up to the rail and took communion, Larry and I did also. So. Yeah. Nobody burst into flames, right? And we're, and we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I, I um, did a funeral where the person was buried in the Catholic part of the cemetery that's over there by Heathy on what, um, Center and 78th or whatever. And we were pulling in, um, in the hearse, and the guy driving it looks at me and he says, don't worry, I'm Catholic, you won't burst into flames. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Other traditions that you realize in... Um, ways which you took communion how many of you usually had wafers growing up because i know we did oh yeah yes yeah um we had little wafers that had yes. Jesus stamped on them right they were and they were, thinner. they were hard you could use them put some cheese whiz yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh she has said that before Do you have a little cheese whiz to go with this <laughs> did you bring your can with you to church Kim? <laughs> Don't give her a <laughs> stick to the roof of your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. The ones that were really thin, really just like 
stuck like a sticker to the roof of my yes. head. Yeah. And, first, mm -hmm. and we took communion at my confirmation and it was that that thing just stuck right to the end. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get it off with your tongue. <laughs> right. yeah. It's like paste. It is, literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then, uh, yeah. What, I think it was maybe Denise and mom, they had a, a wafer testing, tasting. Yes. <laughs> they did. Because they were, the ones were too thick or some were too thin. And so they had little. They, they got tasting. some ladies together and had communion wafer tasting over at Denise's <laughs> house. And yeah. knowing yeah. them, they also had uh, wine. indulged in tasting the wine at the same time. I'm sure. Yeah. My mother looks saintly, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Back in the day and rejoice when we had the old sanctuary and it would come up for communion, you would stand around the white squares mm -hmm. all the way around. And so you would come up. And when those whites, when that space was full, they would stop and all those people would get communion and then mm -hmm. would have the blessing at the end yep. and they would leave. And then the next group of people would come up. So you'd have several, you know, kind of blessings each time, but it was kind of an intimate way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of neat, I think, to do it that way. But Yeah. Yeah. When we grew up, it was one straight altar rail. And like you said, Amy, once the rail was full, then they'd go by and give communion and they'd do a blessing and then the whole row would leave and then the next one would mm -hmm. come up. Yeah. Yes. Is there a meaning uh, when you dip the, the wafer into the wine? Um, it's called intinction. And a lot of that is just because some people, um, especially if you only have a common cup, um, many people don't want to drink out of the same cup and so um, by just dipping it in you're still receiving the wine and the bread but you're just not having the contact with the cup that's really the only the only reason that's done I call that the chip and dip method <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite thing though um, Rod is when they come up and they they get the wafer and then they stick it in their mouth and they go <gasps> oh. <laughs> and I actually had somebody one time want to take it out of their mouth. I'm like, I'll give you another one. <laughs> That's double dipping there, you know. Yeah, the method that we use typically, I call that the bump and run. The bump and run? <laughs> yep. I coined a phrase uh, for baptism for people that don't ever attend church but want to have their kid baptized. It's a splash and dash. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I was called by um, Luther Memorial one day. Their pastor was on vacation and they had a baptism that they wanted to do. And she said, oh, they don't come to church ever, and but they want to do this. I said, oh, so it's a splash and dash. And I, it just came right out. And she I thought she was going to have to pick herself up off the floor. <laughs> She said, no, pretty true. Mm -hmm. um, is, it, is it not common or is it common to do communion at funerals? It, I mean, I know that it's optional, mm -hmm. but. It's yeah. really a personal choice of the family, really. I always ask them if they want to. Um, I know we did at my dad's, but we didn't at mom's. We just decided not to. Um, it, it, I think, is, is it adds a sense to the service of really being with the body of Christ in the midst of a very difficult time in people's lives. Um, and that some people that have hesitated about it and then decided they wanted it have later said, I'm really glad we did. So I, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. But there's no rule that you can't or can or have to. Yeah. Same thing at weddings. Sometimes we'll celebrate communion and sometimes not. Most of the time not. It adds 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of times too, we, we've seen that transition of people from wafers going to using actual bread. Um, and that has just also been kind of a, a preference of the congregation. Um, it's Either way, it, it works. Um, it's whatever the congregation decides. Um, we can thank Courtney. She's the one who um, does all the baking of our bread for us. 
It's the best day around here, though, when she's baking bread in the kitchen and it just smells so good and we know that Jesus is ready. Um, <laughs> and then that one time when I dropped Jesus on the floor and we had to eat it. <laughs> There's also, you know, when we think about um, respecting um, the bread and the wafers and whatever we use for communion and holding that up. Um, in my first congregation up in Lee, they had a a patent, a plate that was fairly flat and we had the wafers on it. And uh, when I bent down one time to give the blessing to a little boy and the tray went down and the wafers went all over the bright red carpet, looked like snow. And Clancy, I can still remember him, he looked at his mom and says, mom, I didn't do it. <laughs> like, okay, I did it. So I'm up there picking them all up and I went and put them on the altar, got new ones, and then I took those and took them outside. But it was just like snow on red carpet. It was great. But so there's <laughs> wonderful, wonderful stories of communion too. I have yes, one I, more if you have time. Yeah. Um, I was in a church uh, one time and it came time to serve communion and there was this major pause and we realized there was no bread on the communion table. <laughs> So the, uh, one of the pastors left and went to the kitchen and came back with hot dog buns. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> we, had, we had hot dog buns, communion bread. <laughs> I had stuck Jesus in the microwave. <laughs> and all of a sudden we went, uh oh, we didn't take it out yesterday. Yeah. Yvonne. Larry likes to tell the story. He remembers at our previous church and some of you that were at LCM, I don't know if you remember, but uh, at one time, some, somehow the communion wine was not the usual sweet. It was very dry and people were complaining, but it ended up that it was during Lent. And so the pastor just said, you realize that we have this dry wine but it's on purpose to remind us of the bitterness of Lent. Oh. oh. Ah. Hmm. I don't remember that. Just, Maybe Larry made the story up. <laughs> <laughs> there was, um, I think it was about two or three years ago at one of the first communions. And one of the little guys went up, took communion and went back in the pew. And his mom said, how was that? And he goes, the wine was a little dry. <laughs> how did he know? <laughs> like, all of a sudden, we got a wine connoisseur in fourth grade. Yeah, that works. Uh, well, as, yeah, there are stories all over the place of, of communion, but I think it's one of those things that um, we celebrate and it is so central to who we are is this gift of grace. And so... Um, I know that both Pastor Daryl and I have missed that part, especially um, celebrating the meal with you. And so it's been a, a challenge um, each week as, as this has gone on forever. Um, and so oh, I have one more question. Yeah. Yeah. That makes me think, do you and Pastor Daryl videotape separate wine uh, communing each other every week or is it just replayed? <laughs> Daryl told us that the other day in class. Maybe we ought to do another yes, one. Yes, Daryl. Daryl told us so. Be sure you tell the truth. The way that my hair is graying, I probably should do another one. Now, in fact, my sister caught it one week. Is because I was I um, didn't have my rejoice jacket on when I did the sermon. But then all of a sudden, when I'm celebrating, <laughs> I had my jacket on. <laughs> Yeah, that part, we, we've done it twice. Um, the first time we've recorded it, and then the second time we did it um, so that it was where we gave each other communion, because the first time we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And it just made it so that we were participating. Um, mm -hmm. So we had done that one instead. So we, yeah, that's, that's the change. What I was going to say is, is hopefully, um, when we do come back to some form of in-person worship, we are working on... Um, I think we've got it figured out now, Courtney, um, about how we will do communion because um, that is one thing that is, is a challenge for all of our churches. Um, so actually it will be when you are dismissed um, to leave 
and that Pastor Daryl and I will stand by the back door. We will have gloves and masks with the bread, give you that. And then on the table will be the prepared glasses, probably plastic, um, spaced out so that you would not have to worry about touching another glass. You would take communion, put the glass in the bowl, and then actually leave. Um, so we were trying to figure out, because that is such a corporate piece of who we are, um, that I think we've got that so that we'd be able to at least continue to celebrate communion, because that's been the challenge in a lot of churches um, that have gone back. And it's about, um, we were in a, a participating in a leadership conference last week, and um, they did a survey of, it was, there were 2,000 churches participating in this conference, and 52% of the congregations have not gone back to worship um, at all. And so we're kind of in that with them. And then they talked about people or uh, congregations that have gone back into worship. What is their percentage of people that are, have returned? And it's very, very low. Um, Cause I think people are still, as we are concerned um, that until there's a vaccine, that's gonna be the safest time to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's gonna be small um, services without singing, without communal speaking, all those kind of things that we love so much. So that's been the challenge to try as we want to make worship the best way possible. Um, so we're, we're working on it. And believe me, um, it bothers all of us that we're not back. And that's not, not what we want to do. Yes. Uh, Carrie went, uh, has begun services at her church. Did she? Outside. They have an outside altar. Oh, it's yeah. Beautiful. It's beautiful. And they have done that. But she found for communion um, a, a deal where you have the wine and the bread yeah. in a single container that uh, you, take the, you yeah. take the cover off the bottom to get the bread and the cover off the top to do the wine. Yep. And so people just pick that up when they go into worship and then it's consecrated, you know, yep. Carrie does that from the front. So the, she found that that has worked pretty well. And that, that way people feel comfortable that they right. can just grab it and no one is touching it directly. And that kind of thing. We, we looked at that. One, the cost is tremendous. Yeah. Especially for as many as we would have. Right. Um, right. But, and also I did some research with a couple of places that I'm not being critical of older people. Okay. But for <laughs> some people, it's the, it's, they're difficult to take apart. Uh, and so it's also the, the wine gets splashed or the grape juice, whatever it is. So some of it has been just practical stuff. But yeah, that, and I, there for a while, I don't think you could get them because everybody was ordering them there for yeah. a while too. Yeah. Well, I think it's been okay for her. They good. don't have the numbers we do, but it, yeah. I think it's worked okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. That's good. Well, thank you. We went over a little, not by much. Um, Next week, what I have always found when we kind of finish the Lutheranism part is to help you understand the workings of the ELCA. Anything from what the presiding bishop is to our local bishop to congregations, what makes up the ELCA. Um, so next week, we'll just finish our kind of Lutheranism stuff with that. Then we're going to do about four weeks on um, the book of Philippians, one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, and just kind of do a Bible study conversation with that. And then comes down the road, we'll do the Outlaw Christian book. Um, so if, um, that one is the one that uh, some of us did the other book that she wrote, Love Without Limits, last year. Um, so this is the one that she wrote actually before this, the last one we did. So that's, that's the plan. And, uh, but next week, a little bit more about what our church is and what we do. Because um, we, are, we are a good group of people. Lutherans are nice. <laughs> My favorite phrase, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Thank Brad. You, Pastor Brad. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Talk to you later, Brad. Okay. Love you. Love you, too.